coming up. Bell ringer is coming up. All right, so what is an experimental and control group? Give an example of both. There you go. Give you some time to work on that. So we talked about independent, dependent variables. Those are very, very important for a study. Okay, what is going to be right, changed in the study to see a response? And what is the response? Now, experimental control. A control group is something that is used also just to see, obviously, make sure that results are not any confounding variables or anything like that. So I'll let you guys work on that. All right, so what do we have for an experimental group? What is that? What is experimental group? This will just go around the room here. Campbell, what do you have? Um, group that is exposed to the treatment. Good job. Group that is exposed to the treatment. And yesterday I showed that picture. I don't know if you saw it in the slides where there's the two mice looking at the other two mice, and the mice were like shivering up and down. And the one was like, oh, I guess we're the control group. They must be the experimental group, which – Kind of funny, maybe not, maybe, maybe a little unethical, I guess. But, yeah, so the experimental group is the one receiving the treatment, okay? And this is very important. Why? Why do you think it's important that a, a researcher places an experimental group? Why do you think it's important for that? What do you think, Campbell? So, like, they can, like, analyze the results and actually know what's going to happen. Yeah, good job. So it's good to know, right? It's good to know who the experimental group is because maybe we can pick out different observable behaviors or observations based off of what we already you know, know of who is the experimental group. All right, what is that called? What kind of study? I know I went over this yesterday. I think I did. I know I definitely did. What kind of study? So when the experimenter knows who is the who the uh, experimental group is. What kind of study is that? Want to help me out here? Hannah, you know? Booker? Camel? Uh no. So I went over single and double blind studies. All right. So if it is a single blind study, that means what? What do you think? You guys remember this from yesterday, the lesson? No. 
So a single blind study is when the experimenter, the person that is performing the research, knows who the experimental group is. So that's easier for obviously the researcher to know and pick out the observable behaviors from that group. Okay. So that's something that, okay, he can kind of focus in on that experimental group and see how their behaviors might be different than the control group. Okay. If that makes sense. All right. And then a double blind study is what do you think? So double blind is what? What's that? Exactly. Good job. So the experimenter, he has no clue who the experimental group is or the uh, control group. Why do you think they are? Why do you think they perform double blind studies? Why do you think? Why do you think it's important maybe to try a double blind study than a single blind study? What do you think, Hannah? Okay. All right. Good. Gamble, what do you think? Exactly. Good job. It eliminates bias, right? It eliminates any type of tendencies that the researcher might focus on that might kind of, you know, almost prime towards his, his results, his research that he's looking to have. So if we have a double blind study, it eliminates any type of bias. Okay. Good job. It's a single blind study. Okay. The experimenter researcher knows who the experimental group is. And finally, a control group. What is that? What is a control group? Uh, Hooker, what do you have? Yeah, that is not receiving the treatment, right? Okay. And this is kind of the group we base our information off of. Right? We see these observations. We, we take our observations from that group and we compare them to the experimental group and how they might differ, right? How they might correlate, right? Okay, good. So make sure you guys remember single blind studies, double blind studies, okay, and then obviously experimental and control group. All right, is there any questions on that? Oh, what examples do you have? So there, you're supposed to put up an example. What do you have here, Campbell? I just said, like, if you were trying, like, testing out a pill or something, the experimental group would get the pill and the control would just get nothing. Yeah, good job. So they get nothing or maybe a placebo, okay? So just show, like, oh, you know, everybody's receiving a pill here. They just don't know. Maybe the, the experimenter obviously knows then who is receiving the placebo and who wouldn't be, who's actually receiving the treatment. All right, good. What about you, uh, Anna? Uh, what examples do you have for both? Yeah, just like. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, okay, like a placebo to see, like to try to eliminate any type of anxiety or stress. Is that what? Okay. All right, cool, cool. You guys listen to music when you're studying? Campbell, do you listen to music? No, you can't focus. No, it's stressing. Oh, does it? Okay. What about you, Booker? No? You don't listen to music? Cam or Hannah? What about you? Yeah? I always listen to music to help me with a job. I don't know why. I just need to hone in on it. When I have music playing, I can hone in on what I need to get done. But if it's like really hard rock, I can't do it. It's like, ah, it's too much. Scream all stuff. Oh, man. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Is there any questions on that? We good? All right. So, that, again, that activity that I put out last week, the end of last week when we're on our snow day, uh, look back to that. Okay, look back at those control groups, those experimental groups. Uh, again, those, those questions are used as practice to help you with the test, right? It's, it's used to help really pick out which variables are which in those statements. And I think it's very beneficial and useful. So, hey, what's up? So I got your roster already from Becky. Uh, oh, okay. If you could just test those out. Yeah, it's only about Okay, you got it. I'll put it in your mailbox. Then. All right, thank you. Have a good one. Can't forget that. I'm gonna put this over here. Does anybody have chemistry at the end of the day, eighth period? Or no, I have it seventh period. No. Oh man. Okay, that's fine then. All right, so vocab. I'm gonna have that due. How about Friday? Does Friday work? 
Okay. I, I feel like we should be pretty much done with that already. Uh, I'm just going to keep moving on. Uh, you, you should have some time at the end to work on the activity I have for you today. And uh, we'll just we'll just move on with that. There's so no more working on vocab in here. We should have it pretty much done. All right, so moving on. Moving on. There we go. So we went over, right, experimental groups. We went over de dependent and independent variables. And uh, we all know the experimental control is used to really help out to try to eliminate any type of confounding variables. What is a confounding variable again, real quick? What is that? What is a confounding variable? Michaela, do you remember? Confounding variable? Do you remember? No? Campbell, do you remember? Yeah, good job. It's like an unwanted influence. It's uh, something that uh, it's a response in your in your study that you're not really looking for. Okay, that could skew your data. That could cause a disruption. Okay, that could really um, uh, really uh, jeopardize your research. So the confounding variable the experimental control is to try to eliminate that. And I, I gave an example yesterday in the video. I always brought them off experiment, right? See how they attracted different colors of lights. And the light shining through the window, okay, experimental control in that, I guess you could say, maybe would be just putting the blind on the window to stop that light coming through the window, all right? And now uh, that might be an experimental control in, involved with that study. All right, so here's the checklist. Uh, make sure you guys remember it. We went over random assignment as well yesterday. We went over randomization. We went over representative sample, okay? Uh, what is a representative sample real quick? What does that mean? What is a representative sample? Hannah, do you remember? No? Representative sample. Michaela, remember this? What a representative sample is, what it could be? I gave you an example yesterday in the video. Are you too busy shoveling snow yesterday? Making hot cocoa, I guess, right? Campbell, you remember? Yeah, it's like when subjects are drawn to require Yeah, good job. Good job. You said dog Yeah, and that, that's supposed to be a representative sample of what then? Like a school? Yeah, good job. Good job. So let's say you wanted to do a study of Upper Dauphin Area High School students. A good representative sample would be this classroom, right? Uh, a lot of that, you know, a lot of representative samples are used just to try to eliminate any type of time expense. Because let's face it, if you try to do a survey or gather information on everybody here in the school, that would take a long, long time, right? So representative samples, some like a small group of people that belong to the population that you're trying to experiment, that you're trying to uh, perform research on. So representative sample is this classroom, right? So in this class, especially today, we only have three students in it. So I can gather data like that quick. And you're all students here at the Upper Dolphin Area High School. Okay, what are some maybe problems, uh, maybe some, I guess say, cons to a representative sample that we maybe need to think about before we conduct a representative sample, let's say with a survey, to this representative sample? What do we need to really focus on? What do we need to try to, um, I guess you could say, think about? when we're giving out this survey. What do you think, Campbell? Like, if the people in the class are like, like they say, yeah. What? Okay, good job, good job. So um, this might be something with how they enjoy school, right? If they're a part of extracurricular activities, okay? It depends what your study is, obviously, but we need to see and understand exactly um, uh, the group of people that we are studying. Right, the representative sample that we are looking to gather information from. It could be students that are, you know, I'm not, again, so I'm not saying this is a good or bad thing or whatever, but it could be a group of students that are involved in honor society. It could be a group of students that maybe come to school two days a week, right? So obviously that information you're gathering could be jeopardizing your research, could be jeopardizing your information, okay? 
And if we're going to go around like test scores or something like that, if you just look at my representative sample in the classroom, everybody in here is good, right? But does that really represent the whole population very well? Let's say we have a group of uh, students in the honor society here. And I want to just try to do a, an example, a, a, a research experiment on their grades in here and how they try to and how they think of school. Right. And uh, that won't really represent the whole population. I guess it's a grade at UDA uh, for the study. When someone looks at it, it's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, they really enjoy school. Their grades are great. OK. Their their uh, motivation in school is is second to none. Right. But uh, if you maybe look at other classes, if you look at other maybe uh, groups of people that we could maybe study. OK. Again, I'm, I'm, I think everybody here does a really great job. I'm just saying that you, we need to really focus on the representative sample and understand who we actually are performing the research on and who we're gathering this information on. OK, because it could differ. It could differ. Right. I know with that group, what was it last year, a senior class? Holy cow. What a bunch of knuckleheads, right? Campbell. Yeah, so if I would have gathered information from them, I could have got totally different information. I could have had a totally different, uh, I guess you could say, research project, depending on their responses to certain questions compared to maybe this year, right? I like that group last year. I'm not saying I don't like them, but some of them acted out a little bit. Okay, so there is the uh, variables I want you to know. And I'd like you to come up with just a study of your own, okay? I'd like you to come up with a study of your own. It doesn't have to be, you know, done tomorrow. i like you to maybe think about it towards the end of the week. Maybe Friday we can talk about it. So maybe it's something that you want to talk about popularity. Maybe it's something you want to talk about mu uh, music, okay? Uh, maybe it's something that you want to discuss maybe about uh, food choices, extracurricular activities, okay? Something along those lines. So kind of go through this checklist, come up with a small case study of what you want to try to find. Maybe it's OK. Maybe it's something you want to see how people uh, how people like or how people uh, enjoy Pizza Delight or JoJo's. And maybe we can compare them all together uh, if we're talking about food or music or extracurricular activities. So come up with your own study. Uh, go through this this uh, th this checklist here. And we can maybe see what we have going on for Friday. Does that work? You have enough time to do that? And again, it doesn't have to be extensive. You can just say, oh, my hypothesis is this. Here's my independent variable. Here's my dependent variable explained here in the hypothesis. Uh, here's a control group that I might have, experimental group. And just kind of go along through the followings of that. What's up, Mikhail? Hold on one. What's up? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so what's going on? Well, my, our church is having a gravel lunch. Oh. March 10th. Church is filling corn, cranberry sauce. Ooh, salad, that sounds good. Salad, I guess. A homemade dessert and a drink for $10. They're going to deliver it here to the school. Okay. Just buy it because we're too we were interested. Yeah, sure. That'd be cool. One? Just one? Or yeah, just are, one. Some people are getting them into the refrigerator and taking them home for supper. Oh. I, just, I didn't. But I'll write you up for one. Yeah, when is it again? March 10th. March 10th. They'll be here at school at 11. Okay, how much is it for it again? $10. $10. All right, I'll do it. Are you sure? Yeah, sounds okay. good. Thank you. Look at that. Cool, cool. What's up, Mikhail? How are you going to test it? Like, how are you going to go through the experiment? Like, uh, picking an experimental control or control group? Um, so, with this, I just kind of want you to. I want to see your knowledge on it. I want to see your understanding of it. So you actually don't have to go out and do it. Okay. I just want to see it maybe come up with one on the top of your head. So maybe it's something with popularity or maybe it's something with music. Um, but with the activity today, I'd like you to use a survey. So you're going to create your own survey so that maybe you can push out to some of your students or your, your, I guess, say your friends, family, and gather the information that way. And you can just use a representative sample size of like five five people, 10 people. You don't have to do like the whole school or anything like that. Okay. But that's what, kind of what I'm looking for. So nothing, nothing crazy, nothing that's going to take you the whole extent of the year. I just want to see your understanding of it. Maybe you can just kind of make it up on the top of your head. And that's what I'm looking at. All right. Does that work? That's for Friday then. Okay. That's for Friday. All right. Moving on here.
Okay, ex post facto, I'd like you to understand this too. So moving on here with research, it's important to know ethical standards, right? It's very important to know that. Uh, we're going to go over some of these famous experiment, uh, ex famous experiments throughout psychology, and I'd like you to do some research on some of them here. I'll have that activity out more maybe towards the end of the week as well. But uh, you're going to look at some of these experiments and see and understand, you know what, maybe they don't follow some ethical codes. Maybe we research these experiments to show for the future, moving on, that we don't make these same mistakes, that we don't make these same um, same decisions, I guess you'd say, when we're creating our experiments. I think it's very important to do that. Uh, usually I'll watch a movie, the Stanford Prison Experiment. You guys ever hear about that? No? It's on Netflix. Okay, it's on Netflix. Maybe we'll watch it in here. I don't know yet. We'll see. There's a lot of cussing in it. I don't know if we're ready for that, but uh, it's a really good experiment. It, it, it didn't have an independent variable, though, interesting enough, and it just really goes kind of on the lines of ethical standards and research. But, again, I'll post that project presentation here maybe towards the end of the week. We're going to research about it, maybe write a one-page synopsis of it, an abstract of what was going on with the experiment. You can pick out the independent, dependent variables and experimental groups, controls, you name it, okay? Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. But with ex post facto, this is research on subjects that already have some sort of pre-existing conditions. So we all know, you know, when we're trying to maybe find some uh, benefits or if we're trying to do research on people that, you know, might have a disease, like let's say cancer, that's really hard to solve, to make sure that we're not putting these people even in more danger obviously, than what they're experiencing already. We try to uh, find research on these people that have these conditions already, these pre-existing conditions. So this allows us to find, uh, find maybe benefits to these problems and benefits to these issues that they're going through and maybe help them throughout these, these, uh, the course of this disease or this sickness or illness that they might have. So ex post facto is just research that is based on pre-existing conditions, okay? And again, this is really trying to follow these ethical standards that are replaced out and set out. And uh, we'll talk about this more towards the end of the chapter with ethical codes and how APA formatting research is established to try to make sure people follow these, these current guidelines. But ex post facto is just research on subjects based on pre-existing conditions, okay? All right, so case studies. We all know what case study is, right? I gave some examples of that already. And a case study is really just um, an example of a research experiment, okay? So they are observational techniques that study one person group in depth with the hope of revealing universal principles. So it's almost like a, it's setting a precedence already. So if we're going to try to perform our own experiment, come up with a new experiment, we use these case studies as examples to pick out and help us guide our research and come up with an experiment that may have already had some similar aspects to it. So case studies are used almost as a way of an example for future experiments. So we can look at these experiments and say, you know what, they didn't follow the ethical standards appropriately. They didn't follow it enough. You know, maybe we, we can perform this study without uh, putting people in danger. Okay, maybe we can focus on these case studies if they're good examples and almost mimic some of the things they have done and some of the experiments that they went through and pick out a different independent variable that might result in a different, uh, different uh, result. Or conclusion. Okay, so case studies are almost as examples that we can use moving forward. And we talked about some with Emily Rosa, right? We looked at that case study and, and saw her hypothesis, her variables that she used, and the experiment and the research and data that she found. Same with Funkst, right? With Clever Hans. So those are examples that we can use to pick out independent variables then and in order for it to make sense in our future research. All right, so a naturalistic observation. 
So naturalistic observation is we are testing subjects. We are making observable uh, records of these people in their natural environment. That's all that means. So naturalistic observation. We are taking observations. We are writing data down. We are writing uh, information down of subjects, people in their natural environment. So if you go to a zoo and you write down behaviors and you, you jot down observations of a lion in the zoo, is that a naturalistic observation? What do you think, Campbell? No, why not? Yeah, that's not their home, right? There ain't no lions in Chicago. <laughs> I don't know. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, they might mimic their environment uh, in a, in a, I guess you could say, a controlled environment, but it's not their natural habitat. Okay, these, these lions, these animals in zoos are fed at a certain time. They're caged up so that they don't escape and cause any type of harm to people. And they're almost just as exhibits for people to see. So naturalistic observation would be more like a safari ride through the, let's say, through Africa or something like that, where we can see these lines in their natural setting. Okay. So I will give some examples of that on a test or a quiz where you have to decide if it is a naturalistic observation or not. One thing we need to take note of, though, if we are performing, let's say, a study and we are observing people in their natural environment, Okay, is that ethical or not? Is that ethical? What do you think, uh, Hannah? If we're just going to the park and they, the people obviously don't know we're studying them, okay, is that ethical? No, you don't think? Why? Why maybe? Okay. Yeah, so let, let's say we actually come up to them right before we make our observations and say, hey, I'm going to study over the course of half an hour here in the park. You think they're going to act differently? Oh, yeah, for sure. Probably, right? Uh, but if we're going to use those results, if we're going to use those observations, after we make those observations, what do we think we should do to that person? Let them know about it, right? It's like, hey, I made some observations of you the past half hour. Uh, is it right if I, if, I, if I publish these results and use it for my research? And the person might say, okay, you can. Just you know, maybe don't use my name. Say anonymous, right? Uh, you can use... You can use uh, these behaviors as long as you don't use my name actually in the study. All right, so that's a way around it, I guess you could say, and make it less creepy, right, and unethical. Okay, good. Is there any questions on that? We're good. All right. Uh, let me see where we're at here. I guess I'll go over it. So longitudinal study. So longitudinal study is a study over one subject or one group over a long period of time. Okay, so longitudinal study, it makes sense, right? It's over the long term. We are looking at a group of people or one person for a long period of time. This might be like 10 years, 20 years, depending on your study. And for developmental psychology, this is great, right? We can see that group of people or that person develop over time, and we have specific detail and observations based on that person for that extended time. We're using only one subject. We're using only one group of people. And that's great because we can detail these observable behaviors over a longer period of time. And uh, we're not studying someone else. It's that same person. Okay, we can see how they develop. Okay, we can see their behaviors, their peer groups that they hang out with. Maybe some social interactions that they have. Okay, we all know we might not all talk to the same friends that we had in, in grade school. We might have different friends in high school. And I know for sure when, if you go to college or after high school, you might not ever talk to those friends again. Okay, some of my college friends I think are more of my, my closer friends than my high school friends, which is hard to believe. But with a longitudinal study, we're studying those subjects, that person, over a long period of time. And we have good reports of their behaviors, of their groups, of their interests, of their uh, of their behaviors. Okay. So one con of it, what do you think? What is a problem with a longitudinal study? What's a negative to it? What do you think, Booker? It is going to take a long time for sure, right? 
Yeah. So one of the biggest things with longitudinal study, a con to it, I guess you could say, is that it takes a long period of time. It's very time expensive. And depending what kind of study you're doing, it could be very expensive financially. All right. Uh, but the information that you're gathering is very specific. So it is a good thing in a way. But for the most part, with a longitudinal study, it is very time expensive. It takes a long period of time. It takes a lot of, uh, I guess, say, discipline for that, that experimenter to take the observational approach to it and write down the information that is presented to them. All right, so make sure you remember the pros and cons to a longitudinal study and what it is. All right, so two other studies I'd like to talk about real quick, and then I want to get to the survey. Maybe we'll get to the survey tomorrow. We're running short on time here, but we'll get to it. So a cross-sectional study looks at the cross-section of the population and studies them at one point in time. Okay, one point in time. So with the longitudinal study, we know we're studying that person for an extended period of time. It's very time expensive. A cross-sectional study is try to eliminate that time expense. Okay, so we might observe someone rather than, let's say, with a longitudinal study, we're studying them for 20 years. That's a long time. A cross-sectional study is we're going to study that person maybe at age five. We look at another person for age 10. We look at another person for age 15, right? And we look at another person, let's say, at age 20. So they're different subjects, right? They're different groups of people that we might be studying. So I guess you could say that's a con for a cross-sectional study, right? We are studying different people, different groups. So do you think those behaviors and observations are going to be the same? Probably not, okay? So I guess you could say that's a negative for a cross-sectional study. But the pro to it, a positive to it, is that what? It's not as time expensive. Okay, we're studying that group. We can get that study done right like that. Okay, we just interview a person or we just observe someone for a short period of time. We look at another person for a short period of time at a different age. We look at another person at a different age, right? So we're eliminating that time expense, but the data is not going to be similar, right? It's going to be objective data. So that's a cross-sectional study. And I give the example No Child Left Behind just because that's something like with education. Right? We all know with standardized tests, does everybody test the same? Does everybody retain the same knowledge and understanding and concepts? No. No, they don't. So is the data accurate? Probably not. But we're trying to get it done as fast as we can. All right, cohort sequential study. Look at the cross-section of a population and then studies them over a short period of time. So again, this is a little bit longer than a cross-sectional study. Okay, We might study someone, let's say, at age 5 to, let's say, 7. We might study another person from age 8 to 10. We might study another person from age 12 to 15, All right? something like that. So yeah, we are studying them for extended period of time, but it's not as long as a longitudinal study. It might be just ages, let's say. Uh, Pay attention, please, Mr. Smells' class. Please report down to Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Smells' class, report down to Mr. Dietrich. Thank you. It might be an observation of, let's say, two to three years rather than a whole extent of 30 years, right? So, or let's say 20 years for a longitudinal study. So we are eliminating some of that time expense. And at the same time, we're gathering more information, more observ observable data than a cross-sectional study. But it's still a little bit more time expensive than a cross sectional study. Does that make sense? You guys got that? Okay. Okay. So those are studies over a long period of time. A lot of it's due with developmental psych. Okay. Seeing how people develop over time. Again, some of their behaviors over, over their development. All right. So a correlational study. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Okay. I want to show some graphs and examples of this more, but well, it's just a relationship between two variables. Okay, whether or not it's a positive correlation, maybe a negative correlation, or let's say it's no correlation. Okay, again, I'll go over that a little bit more in detail uh, towards the end of this chapter when we see and visualize data. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on here. I'm going to move on to the next slide. But a correlation is just a relationship between two variables. That's all I'd like you to know for that for now. All right, and then a survey. Okay, a survey is a great way of gathering information. Pretty quick, right? Depending on how you gather that information. Especially nowadays, we can just use technology, Google Form, to gather that information real quick. Okay? A survey of data. 
So this is a great way to see what people like about music, uh, what type of music they like, what foods they like, maybe restaurants around town that they prefer other others. Maybe it's something with the menu. I don't know what it is. I talk about food a lot, probably because I'm getting pretty hungry here. But a survey is how we gather information. Okay. And real quick, I want to go over some examples of the survey. I created one for you. And, uh, and uh, you, can, you can get that done here soon. I'll, I'll post it as soon as you guys are done with the slide here. And I'd like you for tonight's assignment to create your own survey on a Google form. Okay, I'll show you how to do that. You guys good with this slide? Can I move on here? Okay, good. So I'm going to come up with, I came up with a survey. I'd like you to take it. It's going to be on the assignment here now. I'll post it. I'd like you to come up with your own survey then. All right, how about this? How about this? How about you guys take this survey tonight? How about trying to think how we can maybe eliminate the time because I want to show you how to make a survey first. How about I show you how to do a survey right now so then tonight you can create your own and then when you're done with it you can just post it onto this this uh, this post. You can just put it in the comment or you can attach it to it. Does that work? And then tomorrow you can take my survey. All right so real quick I'll show you how to make one. So you just go to your Google account. Okay you have to be signed in obviously. So I go up here I hit the grid and I come down to forms. So when you go to Google, you'll see forms. You'll click on forms. And this is how I do all my tests. How cool is that? All right. So then you can just go to, let's say, blank quiz. I like to do that. Blank quiz. So when you click blank quiz, it'll come up like a blank copy. And I'll just show you my sample survey here. So it comes up. You can create your own. So I did one on like the merger between middle or uh, between uh, uh, Millersburg here and Upper Dolphin. So I come up with a question, okay, and then I have a directed question. Let's say orange, maroon, and white for the colors that maybe the school district might have. Black, maroon, and white, whatever it might be. But as you can see, I have designed answers, right, so that you can only choose between those those four choices. So that's nice, right? So that can show you exactly uh, and direct your, 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 the people that you're studying towards one answer. Now, if you go down to the bottom, you could do a short answer, right? So they could come up with any colors they want. If they wanted to do pink or lime green, which I don't know why you would want to do that, but let's say for some reason you really wanted that. So you could put a short answer. The, the reason I put both there is because – with a multiple choice question, you're priming, you're guiding your people that you are trying to study towards a towards an answer that you have designed that you want. With a short answer, okay, they can put in whatever they want, and it's going to be a lot harder to choose and pick, right? What colors are more favorable by the people? But if you have a multiple choice question, it's easy to do, okay. So real quick at the bottom, here's how you add these questions in. So you come over here to the plus, add question. It comes up right at the bottom. You can do a multiple choice. Okay, I would prefer you guys just to do multiple choice for now. And uh, you can put in whatever one you want. It could be ice cream flavors. It could be music. Is that it already? Wow, okay. All right, you guys know the gist of how to do this, how to create a survey. And if you need to, you can go up to settings here. Okay, collect email addresses. You can limit to one response, restrict users, okay, your presentation, show progress bar, how far they're getting when, when you have it, okay, shuffle question order, and if you wanted to make it a quiz, you could, but I don't know why you do that for a survey. Okay, there you go. Oh, try to make five questions at least, just five. Sorry about that. Thank you.